Hello, we're testing out the audio at this point, so please bear with us. Uh, we have somebody going to be reporting back to us on the sound quality. Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. She should be uh, chatting in the chat box. So anytime you want to tell us if the sound is good, then we will continue on. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Appreciate everybody tuning in. We will be starting up again in about five minutes. Uh, feel free to tech, feel free to chat any questions you might have uh, in advance of that. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. We'll be back with you in five minutes.
Hi, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. My name is Joanna Nelson, and we're going to go ahead and start our webinar this afternoon. Thanks so much um, for your participation and your time. We're really excited to address um, more discussion on, on Opportunity Zones. We've had a lot of inquiries and interest and excitement about this new program. So we're joined today by uh, with Juan Torres, who is the finance um, team uh, director, and Ryan Eustis, who is the economist for our department. And um, they're going to be sharing their work and, and all their efforts that they've put into to learning more about um, what we're doing as a state and what's going on nationally. Um, before we get started, um, I did want to point out that, that this webinar is a part of the New Mexico Economic Development Department Finance Team webinar series that um, hopefully you've joined us on previous webinars. We host one every month that deals with um, a finance topic. Um, so uh, I hope you enjoy today's session. Um, we do record all of these, and you can find those on our YouTube page um, that you will get a link to after the, the webinar. Um, so hopefully you can join us on, on our uh, future one. Um, and then also, uh, before we get started, just want to fill you in on the finance development team services that we do provide. Um, we are a, a division of the department that we can do financial packaging. We can review and interpret uh, company financial statements. We can engage in financial analysis, do client consultations, and incentive analysis, and, and basically provide financial resource assistance, which means we can help be the connectors for uh, companies and communities that are seeking financing opportunities, whether that's a commercial loan, a grant, um, a bond, any, anything that has to do with financing, we can help um, connect the dots and, and be a resource and a technical assistance provider for um, those inquiries. Some of our programs, if you're not familiar with them, um, we do administer the Local Economic Development Act, otherwise known as LIDA. We administer Fund It, New Markets Tax Credit, New Mexico Credit and Enhancement Program, the Rural Efficient Business Program, and um, Opportunity Zones, which we're going to get into today. So if you have any questions about these, feel free to follow up, and we'll get you the information on them. And just to point out, if you're, you're unfamiliar with the department's work, um, we do have regional reps that represent the department in the, the different regions of the state. So if you are not familiar with your NMDDD regional rep, you can go to this link and um, be connected with them. They are like the boots on the ground for the department in the various regions, and they live there and, and represent the department in those areas. And we also have New Mexico Main Street that's within the department. Um, which is a really great tool and resource in, in some of the rural areas, too. So um, get in contact with these people if, if you're unfamiliar with them and to be connected to the department and our work. So just want to reiterate again that this session is being recorded. So um, if you do have to jump off, we will be sending a link to the recording that's on our YouTube page. You can also access our um, previous webinars um, and topics, and we'll send out a PDF of the presentation. If you do have questions, feel free to go ahead and type those into the questions box, which is in the right hand. It should be showing up on, on the right hand of your screen in that little gray box. Um, go ahead and type your question, and then we'll get to those at the end of the discussion. And so without further ado, I want to introduce Ryan Jusis, the, the department um, economist. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Eustis. I'd like to thank you all for joining the webinar today. Uh, this is our second iteration of Opportunity Zones, 
And uh, in the first iteration, which is on our website, gonm.biz, uh, we really focused on the legislation uh, behind opportunity zones in which we talked about what is an opportunity zone, the mechanisms that go into it. Uh, today, we'll do a little brief overview on that again, um, in which uh, afterwards I'll turn it over to Juan so he can focus and go in a little more depth, and hopefully we have a lot of time to answer your technical questions at the end. Uh, please feel free to, like Joanna said, uh, type those in at any point. So in today's webinar, we'll go over what is an opportunity zone, opportunity funds, or the investment vehicles as we call them, uh, incentives for investors, what happens next, a pseudo calendar timeline of what to prepare for, um, key tools for local governments, what they can look at and what they can start planning to do now before this becomes um, in full effect. And then at the end, we'll do some examples to show you um, of what's going on around the state. So as many of you know, Opportunity Zones were established by Congress in 2017. Uh, it was signed into law December 22nd in the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. Um, opportunity Zones were a little sliver of legislation that was slid in. Uh, it was uh, introduced bipartisanly um, in both the House and the Senate. And the idea behind this originally came in 2015 from EIG, which is the Economic Innovation Group. They really focused and were focused on um, distressed areas around the nation that had been left behind after the recession had turned. Um, what then went on um, was the focus on how to really turn those economically distressed areas into a more prosperous area. Um, and so with that, they came up with the idea of opportunity zones. Opportunity zones are defined as economically distressed census tracts. Um, they have some criteria around them um, based off of uh, LMI and household income, and uh, we'll get into that later on. Uh, the New Mexico Economic Development Department really spearheaded this process uh, from the beginning. Uh, Joanna Nelson, who you heard from earlier, identified this early on and brought it to the department's attention. From there, we reached out to uh, statewide stakeholders, uh, both at the statewide level as well as the local and municipal level, to get information and feedback. From there, we um, came up with a criteria for local stakeholders, those being the county managers or the counties themselves, to turn in applications uh, that were based on census tracts and the projects they had identified in those census tracts. From there, that information was compiled and handed to the governor for her ultimate designation. New Mexico is a pretty unique area. A lot of people consider us an, an entire opportunity zone, but there are 249 tracks that were eligible. Out of those 249, 128 of them were submitted by, um, by counties throughout the state of New Mexico. And from there, we were able to select 63. Opportunity funds. This is where the rubber starts meeting the road in terms of the investment process. Once an opportunity zone has been designated, a lot of people say, okay, what do I do now? Um, the opportunity fund is the actual vehicle that you use to invest within those opportunity zones. Um, with an opportunity fund, they have to be comprised of capital gains. Those capital gains must be declared and once it's declared, um, you will either pay tax on it or invest within an opportunity fund. Once in the opportunity fund, and once it's compiled, 90% of the assets of the opportunity fund must be invested within uh, projects in opportunity zones. There, are, you're going to hear later on about different types of funds, but just to inform you all, there's going to you're gonna start getting a lot of information about different types of funds that are out there. And to be very, very clear, opportunity funds can come in all different shapes and sizes. You'll have some that will be investing nationally, some that will be doing it on a more regional basis, and others that will be specific to one project that could happen in a local municipality. With opportunity zones, there are three types of incentives for investors. And this is where uh, people really want to hear 
what they get from investing into an opportunity fund. And those three are a temporary deferral, a reduction, as well as a permanent exclusion. The temporary deferral is which once you declare your capital gains, you put them into an opportunity fund. The taxes you would pay on the capital gains will be deferred for uh, until 2026. The reduction, which is the second incentive for investors, has to do around the length of time in which your uh, investment is held for. So if you hold your investment in an opportunity fund for five years, your original capital gains that you would be paying tax on will decrease by 10%. And if you hold it for seven years, it'll decrease by an additional 5%. Um, the most important and what I think is the most lucrative aspect of this for investors is the permanent exclusion. And what that means is once your project has been invested and once you are um, holding the, uh, the investment in that opportunity zone for 10 years, after the fact, once you sell your property or sell your assets within there um, and it's held for 10 years, you will not be paying uh, additional capital gains on those earnings from your investment. One thing to be really clear about is your original investment you will pay taxes on, and the longer you hold it for, the amount will be reduced. There are three types of eligible investments uh, for an opportunity fund. Uh, the first are stocks. Uh, those stocks have to be held in a qualified opportunity zone corporation. Uh, you can do a partnership interest in a qualified opportunity zone, as well as business property used in a qualified opportunity zone. Under the business property is where you get into the specifics, where you have a qualified opportunity zone business must use substantially all of its tangible property within a zone and meet a few additional basic tests as well as investments that do not qualify, include funds to funds, your typical SIN businesses, which are your massage parlors, liquor stores, casinos, et cetera. And finally, um, a substantial improvement test applies unless the business property um, is original use. These three criteria are pretty broad and the substantially all definition and the substantial improvement definition basically go to the amount of assets that you must invest and or for the substantial improvements, um, it goes to the rule of 50% must be for the value of the property must be invested. And that's where the IRS is still waiting to release its rules and guidances. So it can be a little more clearer and can define the purpose of those rules uh, better for individuals as well as a uh, partnership. Thank you, Ryan. So this is Juan Torres, and I think uh, Ryan pretty much covered everything, so I think we're done here. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I think uh, to back up a little bit to kind of underscore and stress, um, the qualified census tracts have criteria that are identified. They qualify as new markets tax credit areas as well. Uh, we went through the process of helping the governor to designate the zones or to choose the zones to designate. So now we have zones uh, that are in place and those will remain in place for 10 years. So the next uh, focus um, ideally is on the fund side and um, we're not suggesting that any person or community should go out and set up their own fund, but rather what we're trying to propose is that um, communities and individuals like developers or projects that have uh, that, that want to move forward should be prepared to um, determine and explain how their uh, projects are shovel ready and, and ready to move forward uh, if they exist within the funds. So uh, in basic, uh, again, Ryan covered a qualified opportunity fund is an investment vehicle that can be a corporation or a partnership. Um, and the point of that investment vehicle is to deploy um, realized capital gains that have been deposited into that fund. Um, and then, th then those, those proceeds, 90% of them, 90% of them at least, 
have to be deployed within the zones, within any qualified uh, opportunity, excuse me, within any designated opportunity zones. So uh, a few things that happened over the summer, I think it, June was the determined. Um, so uh, the IRS determined that uh, there's no approval needed, um, that uh, individuals can self-certify and uh, they can go ahead and start funds and subsequently a few, uh, a few funds have begun to crop up and we'll talk a little bit about some of those. Um, for instance, uh, we have identified, uh, and again, a Google search of this, uh, you have uh, the uh, website uh, information. So JMA Ventures in San Francisco has been operating since 1986. They do real estate, portfolio, hospitality, et cetera. They have um, specifically targeted uh, investments in multifamily, hotel, and mixed-use real estate projects located in opportunity zones. Um, and uh, so you can reach them from, from there. They have expressed that they will or have set up a fund. Um, Virtua Capital Management, again, the, uh, the URL is on the screen and you'll get the uh, presentation as well. They launched a fund to invest in Opportunity Zones. They've identified $200 million uh, for that fund and they intend to uh, invest primarily in the South East and the Southwest. So this is definitely one to try to uh, get in contact with if you have projects in opportunity zones and you're looking for an opportunity fund to deploy uh, those funds within your uh, within your area. And these guys have identified the Southwest as an area they want to invest in. And we're currently working on getting more direct communication with these funds. And, and as we get that. Uh, we'll pass that along and put them on our website, you know, contact name and phone number and things like that. Um, the RXR Realty is another fund. Uh, they've identified a $500 million uh, fund that they intend to uh, deploy. They intend to raise it from high net worth individuals uh, and wealth management channels. Uh, and so they will be, uh, they, they're in New York. They've gotten a lot of press. Um, and so they got a pretty high, uh, they set a pretty high bar for a $500 million uh, fund. Um, so North Coast uh, Partners LLC is another $500 million targeted fund. They are in Michigan. They are concentrating on Detroit and Michigan, um, and they will be deploying uh, those funds in a number of different uh, low-income pockets. Uh, kind of focusing on community development. The important thing to note, again, if you have projects or if you're looking for funding for your project and if your project is in an opportunity zone, these are potential investors. Um, while they may be identifying different regions of the country, they can invest their funds in any opportunity zones. Um, and if your project is shovel ready and has a good rate of return, I, if I were them, I would certainly consider deploying. Um, so what's the likely timeline looking like? Well, everything's been pushed forward, I guess is the word. So um, we've been waiting for IRS rules. Uh, they were supposed to come out this summer. The, um, the light of summer quickly dims. And so we think that uh, that'll be pushed uh, into the fall, uh, early winter. Um, those are technical rules um, that, um, that are important, um, but that necessarily won't stop uh, the creation uh, or the funding of a fund. It would mostly affect the deployment um, as most of the rules that were identified already about uh, how to realize those gains and how to transfer them into an opportunity zone. Um, we're really looking for the action to start, well, we have different opinions, but I, I think it'll really start at the beginning of 2019 um, others think that things will be pushed into 2021. Uh, so it's a moving target, but as we get information, we will post that on our website. We will send out alerts to communities and to uh, and to projects that identify themselves. Um, and uh, you know, our goal is to try to help communities position themselves um, with respect to opportunity zone opportunities. Switching gears a little bit as uh, as as you may have just heard from Juan, uh, there's a lot of funds out there that are being set up. 
And uh, what those funds are looking for, and Juan was very candid in saying it, is the return on investment. Um, they're looking for shovel-ready projects um, that will not only uh, be done in a timely manner, but bring a sense of return to the project that brings more net worth to the individual. Uh, with that being said, local governments are in an interesting position because they really need to start the planning process on what to do going forward. There's estimates of six to seven trillion dollars out there in unrealized capital gains. And with opportunity zones being in every state, um, the competitive nature for those funds uh, is going to solely rely on either the project themselves, uh, but in my opinion, more on the local government planning process to get everything in place so they can implement and attract investors into the region. So things for local governments to really focus on, um, in my opinion, going forward is the land use. Um, have you guys identified zoning uh, in the in the opportunity zone to protect uh, or to attract uh, particular businesses and investments into the area? Has the planning been addressed? Um, basically, are the properties and businesses in those zones identified? Um, is there a comprehensive plan that the local municipality has in place that they are looking to, um, that opportunity zones and opportunity fund investment will help speed the process along? Knowledge base. This is, in my opinion, one of the most important. Are the local governments uh, capable and able to be able to understand what is in their track specifically? Do they know the number of businesses that are there? Do they know who the landowners that are located within that track? Do they know who they are? Um, the education component uh, as well, not only education of the local government of knowing what an opportunity zone is and the technical aspects of a fund, but being able to articulate that to uh, the local mom and pop stores who may be able to do the investments. Uh, when, we're, when we're out and about speaking to communities or businesses or stakeholders in opportunity zones, um, taking the time to really walk them through the process and what may be required of them is something that goes a long way. Um, a lot of the you'll hear a lot of funds that have a social impact to it. So if there are some sort of social impact investing that you're looking to attract, understand that you're not the only municipality or opportunity zone looking to attract that. So you really need to be sure that your area has identified um, what it's looking to do and, and how it stacks up against other zones nationwide. The incentives and community uh, investment as many of you know, uh, and Juan highlighted earlier, opportunity zones are uh, fall within new market tax credit zones. So what you're able to do is stack uh, multiple incentives onto projects that may be moving into the area, whether it's local um, or um, there could be new market tax credit uh, funding available for these sorts of projects. It's just a matter of really educating uh, yourself and the project to make sure you're getting your best bang for your buck and the final and, and probably the most important aspect of it is marketing your specific zone. As um, many of you know, you as a local government or a local, local, local stakeholder know your area better than anybody else. So being able to highlight your zone and be able to get the business plans and your comprehensive plans in order to show investors that this is where the best return on investment is going to come from and here's why. Um, that'll go a long way. Uh, just having the designation of an opportunity zone does not mean money and investment is going to flow to the area. So staying on this slide for a little bit, um, because I wanted to kind of chime in on a few of these points as well. And Joanna, feel free to chime in too if you want. Um, but on the land use piece, you know, again, we hear a lot of, well, what should we be doing? Uh, what should we as a community be doing? This is a perfect opportunity to consider some sort of uh, ordinance uh, locally or fast tracking permitting perhaps in those zones for some uh, 
potential pre-permitting or pre-planning on permitting so that you can really expedite uh, the projects. And I think, uh, you know, this is a good time to, to look at those sorts of tools um, uh, closely. Uh, again, using existing plans, you know, a lot of times we see uh, economic development plans, we see local government planning uh, plans, uh, comprehensive plans. You know, it's time to take them off the bookshelf and dust them off and open them up and take a look and see what they say about feasibility, about uh, different industries, about how to uh, go about uh, answering the question of developers when they say, is that road wide enough for me to tur you know, uh, turn a, uh, a single or double 18-wheeler? Uh, uh, is there enough uh, uh, turning radius? Uh, could, I, could I store uh, you know, windmill, uh, windmill components in there? They're notoriously long and large. So knowing those things, it goes very, very, very far to, uh, to making sure that you can attract projects to your community. Um, social impact is a very interesting point. It's, it's an emerging, emerging field specifically in this area. Um, we've had a number of conversations with some local foundations, um, and I believe the Kellogg Foundation has got a request for information out, trying to better understand how they might participate um, in this sort of a, of a program. Um, I, I would use, I would kind of highlight uh, something like the Santa Fe Community Foundation, for instance, that I think recently was involved uh, in a project uh, as a leverage lender through another organizational uh, kind of component uh, to be a leverage lender in a new market tax credit uh, project. Um, in that case, that particular project would not have uh, been able to be utilized because it didn't uh, have a number of, of key econometric components, but it did have a very powerful local community uh, uh, impetus. And so um, in that case, I believe Santa Fe Community Foundation was able to act as a leveraged lender. So it's that sort of position where foundations could be providing guarantees or they could be providing some planning assistance, or uh, they could be a leveraged lender potentially in a new markets project uh, where where you can have you know a a some a structure that kind of looks like uh, you know you've got your new markets investor, you potentially have your opportunity zone investor, and maybe you have another leveraged lender that could be a community organization uh, that wants to uh, help. Uh, uh, kind of motivate this project and then synthesize this project because it's going to have very key social impact. One more thing to highlight here is uh, we did talk a lot about incentives and uh, Juan did, did spend some time on the social impact, uh, but the idea and the premise behind Opportunity Zones was for the market to drive where the funding's going to go. So you will hear a lot about Kellogg Foundation and other foundations that have a guarantee attached to it. But taking a step back and looking at the original legislation and understanding that this was meant for high net worth individuals, companies, or partnerships to deploy their funding to receive a return on investment really dictates where these six to seven trillion dollars is going to go. And making sure your projects are shovel ready and you are capable of showing the return on investment will go a long way. So uh, along those lines, we picked uh, just two tracks to highlight um, because um, just to try to give an example of how you know a community can position itself and, and what are the so what are the different options. So. The Santa Fe University of Art and Design tract is what we're calling it is in the heart of downtown Santa Fe, uh, recently vacated uh, by the uh, Santa Fe University of Art and Design. Uh, the tract is uh, owned uh, ostensibly or primarily by the city of Santa Fe. There are a couple of other private entities within that, but primarily it's the Santa Fe, the, the Santa Fe city of Santa Fe. Um, and they've recently sent out a community-wide kind of uh, surveys to try to determine interest. Uh, 
but primarily looking at the broad tract attractiveness for this particular tract, you know, we can see fairly quickly that its proximity, its proximity to I-25 as well as to I-40 in Albuquerque. Uh, so one hour's drive from International Airport, very close to a highway. Um, it's one of the key features that it does have is its access to Los Alamos National Laboratory and the connection both from a workforce standpoint, um, but also from a technical, a technical assistance standpoint. Um, nonetheless, Santa Fe also would have access to the, uh, the various other uh, resources, including Sandia Labs and Air Force Research Lab. Um, this particular tract is located fairly close to the ReadyNet fiber optic network. The ReadyNet was deployed about two years ago, possibly three years ago, um, through uh, the Broadband Technical Opportunity Program. Uh, and so uh, the point is that within spitting distance of this track, there are conduits with 144 strands of gigabit uh, network available for projects. Um, the city of Santa Fe owns the property, and again, it's currently being marketed for various uh, uses. So this is a prime opportunity to try to get uh, investors to take a look at this tract. Um, it's a 60-acre tract, again, in central Santa Fe, near ac access to fiber, and it's very developable. Developable. <laughs> um, looking closer at the tract, we can see that, again, it's right in the heart of uh, what would you call midtown Santa Fe. Um, it's... Uh, it's, you know, it's a but uh, St. Michael's Drive, Cerritos Road. Um, on the other side, I think Yucca has a road uh, connection to it. Um, it does have a, a brownfield um, a component, but that's not a bad thing because there are ways to mitigate those uh, and redevelop those properties. Um, and currently, I think last time I checked, there was some sort of state um, uh, ownership or, or some sort of state control over those that portion of the tract. But nonetheless, um, the city established, the city of Santa Fe established an ordinance, I think, called the Midtown Local Innovation Corridor. And it identifies a lot of the things that they're looking to do there and incentivize. Uh, so this tract comes ready built with a lot of community uh, focus a lot of uh, ideas for development, and uh, I think it would be a pretty easy sell once you get a fund that might be interested in, in for instance, a mixed-use commercial uh, real estate development that includes educational components and perhaps uh, quality of life things. So again, this is the kind of thing that we're encouraging communities to consider, to look at, position your tract, look at your tract, but understand what what the value proposition is for those tracks, and then uh, tell the world about that uh, those opportunities. So shifting gears to the southern part of the state, um, we're looking at a Doña Ana tract uh, down at the border. Um, very, you know, I feel like a real estate agent. Very attractive. I've got a very attractive lot right on the. New Mexico, Mexico border. Um, it includes the Doniana County Airport, and it's approximately 10 miles away from the Las Cruces International Airport. Um, it's got a very good proximity to I-10 and I-25. Um, I-10 being primarily in uh, Texas. Um, it's a very large track with major vacant land holdings. Uh, there's uh, an existing Vision 2040 comprehensive plan that's there as well as a border area economic development plan. Looking a little closer um, at that track, I mean, we can see right here that, again, its proximity to 25 and to 10 uh, is, is just great. Um, and it's, it's also, it's got great uh, feature in that it's, it's got proximity to other qualified tracks. And so as a result, for instance, let's say you have a major transshipment hub that you want to set up there with a logistics park, but you want to set up the warehousing somewhere else. 
conceivably you can decide to set up warehousing um, in another opportunity zone and take advantage of those opportunities uh, and, and then have uh, or vice versa you know having the airport uh, connections there as well as the uh, fairly new 400 million dollar Union Pacific transmodal facility uh, and a, uh, a major FedEx location um, this tract is highly, highly um, uh, attractive uh, to an investor uh, and could be a very, very good commercial um, enterprise. So we are going to like stop there. I want to also kind of underscore, we talked a little bit about marketing. If I were a community and I had these um, sorts of tracks, um, uh, in my city or in my county, I mean, I would start to try to put these attributes together, put a little uh, electronic brochure that outlines the, all the key features um, and encourage your local government entities to, um, to be able to, you know, enact ordinances to incentivize these tracks even further. And again, I think the low-hanging fruit there is probably um, the um, uh, kind of any fast-track ordinances or any pre uh, kind of pre-planned or pre-permitted areas. Um, looking for uh, when I mentioned the, the I'll go back to a second here the Doña Ana County uh, track for instance they've got on their books and they're working on some uh, major industrial road uh, development and repairs as well as the repairs to a uh, peak Dimensi highway so these are all coming and you know looking at the needs of a track like this you can easily add into the uh, infrastructure capital improvement plan oh we need to have a road from the airport you know to the heart of this track or we need to have some other way to get from this airport to this airport or maybe we should have the consideration of a, of a rail spur if you know you have the ability to get that which is a pretty high hurdle in terms of spurs but the point being is to look at your tracks in your communities look at them critically um, to that end we're going to be working um, so this is only again this is just kind of a filling in on where are we now um, tell us a little bit about what we could expect uh, on our website going forward Ryan so in the coming months, uh, the department has been uh, gathering information from all the census tracts uh, that were designated as opportunity zones. And though the department isn't going to be the key marketing arm, we want to be able to highlight key attributes like Juan just did from a 30,000-foot uh, view, and then as it um, as the process goes on, start drilling down deeper to help identify specific areas that um, that have a need. And what we're doing is we're creating what they call a story map. Uh, with that story map, um, we will be showing the high-level view as well as the low-level satellite imagery of the track so we can then help identify where certain projects can locate and show the benefit uh, not only from a specific track level but then start showing the benefit to the entire state. Um, we're expecting to roll this project um, as a as we're doing it, we're expecting to um, get this off the ground and ready for testing. I would say in the next week to three weeks is when I'll start getting initial feedback and showing uh, members of the department. And as we're looking at that, um, we'll then start branching out to local and countywide stakeholders so they can start putting feedback of certain layers they may want to see on that map. Yes, and I think part of the, one of the components that I I saw some of the preliminary conversations that your team was looking at, um, potentially uh, adding the GIS layer for broadband, which you currently can get, and I don't know how many people know this, but uh, at the uh, Do It Department of IT's website, if you go to uh, NM Do It, uh, you Google that, uh, there's a broadband map link. And what you can do is click on that broadband map link and I don't know if we have time, maybe we could try it uh, live. But um, but you can basically determine uh, the broadband uh, and other uh, capabilities uh, within a uh, community. In fact, I feel really bold. I'm gonna try to do this live as the 
let me see if we can get this thing rolling here. And as one's going through that, I uh, want to reiterate a few key facts of, uh, of what we were discussing today before we try to get into your technical questions. A lot of the projects that we discussed and showed uh, were economic development based. Um, that's not the case for all projects that could take place within an opportunity zone. It could be anything yeah, sure. from housing to hotels to road projects. So sky is the limit on opportunity zones and opportunity zone investments. It's just a matter of having individuals and the projects identified going forward. So Juan's pulling up what it looks like the broadband map for the state of New Mexico. And this is one of the components we're looking to eventually overlay within that story map. So we're able to show uh, future companies that may be locating here or expanding within the state a lot of the access that that uh, that's at their fingertips, no pun intended. Um, so as Juan goes through this, I'll let you or I'll let him uh, talk you through what you're seeing on your screen right now. So basically, there's a lot. These map has a lot of different features of what uh, there's different programs. What I'm trying to do is to identify a few that are very this broadband for business, uh, and then it's got schools and their fiber uh, uh, coverage as well. So this shows the overall everything that's available. If we take out some of these highlights, we can reach down into, kind of drill down into the specifics. Uh, for instance, cable DSL fiber, uh, other copper wireline, fixed wireless. So we turn off some of these uh, components and then see what the ones that seem to make sense. And as we zoom in to we really see if we can find that actual tract <laughs> in, uh, they were right around there, Las Cruces, there we go. And I think down La Mesilla, da da da. Anthony, I think we're kind of around that track. I think it's somewhere in here, if I'm not mistaken. So this tells us that there is some DSL cable and fiber um, in this area, and it's a question of kind of drilling down. If I take out DSL and I take out cable, there's the fiber. <laughs> so. The point is that you could look at a track and turn on this layer and then start to see what are the telecommunications uh, infrastructure associated with that. So hopefully that's going to be a component of the map that we put up on our website and as well as being able to identify the tracks and have uh, individual communities be able to update those tracks with more information as it comes in uh, about uh, how those tracks are, are very uh, very viable. So Juan, uh, you're taking us through this process of looking at the broadband map. Obviously there's going to be other components that companies or that communities, excuse me, are needing to identify. Is this part, are you showing us part of the process when it comes to the planning uh, for identifying projects or identifying investment opportunities within an opportunity zone? Yeah, I think you can use this to say we really need some broadband and you can start to look at you know, what it's going to take to get that broadband expended there. And in certain cases, especially on the rural, the rural projects, uh, you can have some, uh, at least some loan guarantees and some other mechanisms um, through the USDA uh, Rural Utility Service to, let's say there's a project that's looking at, the, at, at it deploying there, but it needs broadband. So you can go to RUS and you can determine whether that project would qualify and then try to figure out whether that uh, guarantee uh, to extend the fiber to that project might uh, enhance the ability of the project to make a decision about locating there. So um, again, I mean, I would encourage everybody to go uh, to uh, New Mexico's broadband map uh, that you can reach through the Department of IT, um, look at your tracks, determine where your tracks fit into the existing telecommunications, um, and that's just one component. Obviously, there's roads and there's all kinds of other uh, infrastructure pieces, 
but it's really critical for communities to be able to, to, to say with, with confidence, this is what the tract is, this is what's around it, uh, as I mentioned, the highways, the, the roads, the broadband, and to try to determine for the prod to make it as smooth as possible for a fund to say, we're ready, we're ready to go tomorrow, just bring your fund here and deploy into our project. And at the same time, in some cases, um, you can identify very positive social results. Um, I know in Las Cruces right now, um, most of the MRA of the TID area downtown is in fact uh, covered by, by a brownfield. There's a lot of brownfield activity there. Uh, but again, that kind of, uh, that kind of activity uh, is got a double, it's a, you know, it, it does come with some resources for mitigation and it does allow the community uh, to be able to engage in economic development projects um, to provide land in exchange for development, uh, as long as there is some uh, public benefit uh, that's identified. Um, so Las Cruces has a number of different properties um, that the city owns, and they're actively marketing within uh, within the uh, their their tax increment district. Uh, and it's also a brownfield. I'm not sure if it's in the opportunity zone, but again, this is all kind of like uh, just trying to get ideas for different communities about what, and here's the connectivity. I think the primary connectivity uh, there is, I would guess, cable. Uh, yes, I would guess right. <laughs> so cable is the primary uh, means of uh, broadband uh, connectivity in Las Cruces. But anyway, I would encourage everybody to utilize these tools. I see we have a number of questions, so I'm going to uh, go to the questions panel. Sure, thanks Juan and Ryan. Um, we've got a couple of questions. The first one is, uh, there does not appear to be investment potential for new businesses, startups, correct? Only real estate or real property? Yeah, I think that's fair to say. I think, you know, we have an administration that uh, you know, is headed by an individual that uh, was a real estate uh, developer. And so it's no surprise that that's the program we end up with. But, you know, in defense of the, of the program, um, the, uh, the point of this, again, utilizing new markets tax credit criteria is to address blight and, and low to medium income, poverty, um, those, those, those factors generally will not be affected by startup um, properties, uh, et cetera. Um, now, having said that, uh, I can point to Vitality Works as a company down in Albuquerque. They were not a startup by any means, but they did start in Albuquerque uh, maybe uh, 10, 12 years ago. Um, but they let, they located by definition in a in a blighted area because that was where the cheap real estate is. Well, they've grown and they've grown, and uh, they're also it's also a new markets tax credit area. They took advantage of the new markets tax credits uh, to expand the physical location of the operations, um, and very importantly, they um, employ a number of low income individuals that uh, take public transportation to and from there. So again, it doesn't directly address your question. You're correct that um, these are not fund opportunities for startups unless those startups are going to be massive infrastructure type startups, which generally startups are not. One thing that uh, that I have seen at least, and to Juan's point, the lowest hanging fruit in, is in this is real estate. And that's not to underscore what else can be done though is you know some companies may be loaded, located within an opportunity zone and they're looking to uh, raise money so they're selling stock there's ways in which if you're creative enough that you're able to do investments within specific projects the way the rules and the legislation is written is it's truly the wild west there's no rules there's no true legislation for a reason um, there have been a lot of early movers, and those early movers that have invested and have um, already deployed assets into an opportunity zone have been real estate. So here's an, another example. Again, uh, in downtown Albuquerque, um, I think it's ABQID, um, and it's one part of the larger Central Avenue corridor expansion, but 
Um, they've been, uh, you know, uh, trying to get investors uh, to invest in uh, what is ostensibly uh, kind of uh, a remodeling a historic building that would then house a, a startup uh, hub of, of different activities. So again, not directly going to affect a particular company, but this is potentially a mechanism that ABQID could look at for attracting investors, especially investors that want to have a social impact as well as a return on investment. This is a key way for them to be able to look at getting those buildings built, which would then provide uh, pr spaces for un entrepreneurs. Thanks. Um, the next question is, are investments in an opportunity fund restricted to only money generated from a sale of assets that has gain? What if the sale generates a capital loss or neither a gain or a loss? Um, so thank you for that question. If you get a loss, you take it from your existing tax liabilities. Um, so if there's neither a gain nor a loss, then if you're going to sit on the investment long term, uh, I mean, it all depends what your investment goals are. The, the short answer is you are correct. You, not, you need to realize a gain in order to deploy those gains into a fund, which you then can deploy in an opportunity zone and have an opportunity to reduce or eliminate those, the, the taxes on those gains. Now, in addition to that, and again, the rules are still being developed, but there is every indication that at the end of the 10-year period, the gains, the difference between the initial investment and the gains made uh, are also uh, going to be reduced because you're only going to pay the difference in the, in the amount of taxes. So if you had a $100 million project to start with and you made another $100 million, you're only going to pay taxes on the difference between those two minus the uh, the gains that you paid previously. So I was just reading about this in Forbes, and, and this is there's a lot of novel thoughts on investing and how to look at this. Um, and I think once I, we can distill this information down, I think we can put that on our website as well. Um, but yes, you do need to have a capital gain and realize that gain and then deposit those gains into a fund to deploy in an opportunity zone. One of the things uh, that a lot of people have asked asked me on, on phone calls, and I'll, I'll ask this question to Juan, is am I able just to take money out of my bank account and start my own opportunity fund? Um, you are if you're a high net worth individual who has access to a lawyer and an accountant and a financial uh, expert. I wouldn't advise anybody to do that. However, the vehicles that we identified earlier on in this presentation, the uh, RXR fund, uh, the, uh, the various funds that were identified, potentially those funds would be available or open to individual investors. Um, and, and I'm not sure how the mechanism would work there. I mean, again, this is a very novel approach. I think the, the main takeaway for that is, you know, there's a certain, usually a threshold uh, in terms of finance where this kind of thing makes sense and below which it doesn't make sense. I don't know what that number is, um, but, um, but potentially individuals could look at investing into these funds as well. Um, as we go forward, we'll get more information on that. Thanks. And the next question is, the map on the NMEDD website is not partial specific. How can I find out if a specific property is within an opportunity zone? And this is kind of a, another part to it. How often, if at all, will the opportunity zone uh, be updated? So addressing the parcel question, um, the map that we have on our website is a PDF map, and it is not parcel specific. The CDFI, who is a department within the Treasury Department, has an interactive map. Um, that interactive map is uh, able to zoom down to street level satellite imagery. I would recommend starting there. Uh, as I was saying earlier, we are working on 
uh, deploying a statewide map that has those capabilities in which you're able to see specific parcels of land. Um, the hard part, and I've uh, been working with a county up north, is identifying who the owner is on that land. So you'll really have to take it and uh, do a little more in-depth research, which I'm capable and more than willing uh, and able to help you. Now to your second question is, uh, I believe is, was the opportunity zones or will the zones expand at any point in time? And every indication is that it's not going to happen. Um, there have been discussions though about making the tax law permanent. And I know that doesn't really answer your question, but it raises more questions down the road of what happens to investments, what happens to the capital gains, things like that. But from everything that I've been able to read here and discuss with other individuals who are focused on opportunity zones, what you see is where uh, the opportunity zone designations will be in place until 2026. So, and I think the question was whether the zones would be updated. So I think the update part to me is, again, as communities get more information or put up more information about what makes those tracks attractive, why those tracks make sense, that information can be uploaded once, as Ryan says, we get our website up and running. Um, I think currently on our website, there is a link to the CDFI uh, map. And so you can go to uh, go, G-O-N-M dot B-I-Z, and you can search um, under Opportunity Zones, and you should find a link to the CDFI map which is uh, a really cool, neat map in itself. And uh, the next question kind of uh, is, is in that same regard, but um, I don't know if you, if you want to fill in a little bit more, but it's, uh, will any, any of these tracks expand? If your property is across the street, would you be able to expand one block? The answer to that is no. Um, I know I touched on it a little bit before, but to make it very clear, there is no indication that a second iteration of opportunity zone designation is going to come out. So the 63 that the state of New Mexico has designated or had, uh, that is designated is, is going to be in place for the foreseeable future. We do not think or believe that there will be any updates to expanding the zones. And that's kind of the the cliche part with the census tract is you could have a building that's not in the zone and right across the street, you're in an opportunity zone. So it is very specific to those census tracts. And there is a history uh, to this, again, going back to what the opportunity zones come from. They come from New Markets Tax Credit um, Qualified Census Tracts. So uh, we have a 25, 40 year history, <laughs> a many year history of the New Markets Tax Credit Program, um, whereby those issues were directly uh, brought up and they were pretty clearly, if it's not in the tract, if it's not in the zone, uh, it won't qualify. Juan, you've, uh, you've talked a lot about the New Markets Tax Credits. Have you seen any indication uh, that there may be some sort of federal funding or new markets tax credit funding may be associated with the opportunity zones? Um, I don't know. Actually, when we had a conversation with the Department of the Treasury um, about six months ago, I believe, we asked them, I think the question came up, I think we asked it specifically, which was, does the federal government uh, plan to, uh, you know, have targeted uh, resources for opportunity zones. And at the time, the answer was, uh, you know, that it's been discussed, but nothing's been decided. So I would uh, stay tuned, I guess. Uh, if um, if I was to make a venture to guess what something like that might look like, it would probably look like something uh, associated with an infrastructure uh, plan uh, that may have some additional uh, federal funds that could match certain funds to build out infrastructure associated in opportunity zones or, or things like that. So I think it would it would probably be along the lines of uh, making opportunity zones more priority for any kind of infrastructure funding that might become available. 
The next question is, could you please explain the 2021 deadline to take advantage of five year step up? So um, the, the question is uh, about the step up in basis points. And I'm gonna switch back to a few slides ago. I apologize here. Uh, sorry. Uh, what you're seeing is uh, that 2021 deadline it, it has to do with the sunset, which occurs in the year 2026. The sunset is the entire Tax Cuts and Jobs Act tax law. That will sunset. So by investing by the year 2021, you'll be invested in that opportunity fund for five years, which you'll see will receive the 10% reduction in the capital gains tax. So that's what that, uh, that window has to do with. So I think we had, a, uh, at some point we had another chart, but it was a little more clear that it showed after five years, if if you can get your investment in and you get it done in five years, you'll get a 10% reduction. And every subsequent period, you can get 5% and 5% for about a maximum of a 20% overall reduction in the initial gain. So it's... Uh, a function of the longer the funds are kept deployed in an opportunity zones, over 10 years you have an opportunity to uh, wipe out most, if not all, of those gains. The less time you have those funds in there, the less that you're going to be able to recoup. So you could do a very simple uh, internal rate of return analysis to determine if you're an investor let's say you need to have uh, you know, a 10% rate of return and you calculate how much you know, the gain uh, uh, amount is and the cost and then what the reduction point is over time and you can determine when uh, you might reach that idealized internal rate of return. And it could be under 10 years depending on the size of the, uh, of the funds that you have uh, capitalized. Next question. Um, well, rather, this is this is a comment coming from uh, Deborah Burns, and she said that she's she's on the call and uh, wanted to point out that if anyone has uh, questions about um, how to get a fund, you can refer them to the various funds mentioned or to me. So, so uh, yeah, Deborah, welcome. Um, me and Deborah, Deborah and I, uh, will be uh, doing uh, a sort of similar discussion. Um, next week, actually, in Portales, uh, Roswell, and Clovis, in which we're meeting with local stakeholders to discuss a lot of the basics around it and then hopefully to answer more technical questions. So Deborah and I will be hitting the road uh, next week and possibly um, maybe to a city near you in the near future. And, um, yeah, hi, Deborah. And Deborah is with Invest US in Albuquerque and she's investigating setting up a fund and I would encourage people to call her um, and find out more about what she's up to. Um, another pitch I'll make is that um, we uh, have a planned uh, uh, track on uh, this subject at the uh, October 25th uh, it uh, is led a New Mexico Infrastructure Finance Conference. So by that time we're going to have a live we're going to have a live audience with a Q&A, and it's all going to be fun. But uh, by that time, we anticipate a lot of the unknowns might be known. And so uh, Ryan and I will be uh, presenting uh, a uh, one-and-a-half-hour presentation at the New Mexico Infrastructure Finance Conference, specifically on Opportunity Zones. So stay tuned for that. And if, we, uh, you know, if you're interested in that, you can sign up for our emails, and we can blast that information to you uh, as it gets open. Great, thanks. So we've got about six more questions, six, seven more questions to get through. So um, the next question is, we have a rural shovel-ready business park project with $2.5 million in secured EDA PDBG funding for infrastructure development. We have a five-year plan with feasibility analysis. For OZ marketing purposes, can we just download NMEDD story map for the zone? To complete the electronic brochure, or are there other components? 
So when it comes to the marketing, um, this is solely based on you. Uh, you as a community or you as a project within that opportunity zone are responsible for your own marketing of said zone. Uh, that's why really Juan and I try to stress the local government portion is making sure you have all your ducks in a row and then your marketing material is comprised to identify that project and get it out to investors. And I would recommend finding investors. I would start locally at the grassroots and work my way out, reaching out to individuals um, who may have capital gains, whether it's banks or companies located within that or uh, within the area that may have capital gains. So a large manufacturer or a large mine, for instance, may have capital gains that they could deploy to invest within a specific project. And I think that it's certainly a subject that we would look at in the future uh, to see who we can partner with. I think I can see a future Opportunity Zone uh, conversation about marketing your community's uh, qualified track. So that's thanks for that question. And we'll certainly look and see how we can help that along. Great, thanks. Next question is, what is a requirement for timing and deployment of dollars within the Opportunity Fund? And a related part of the question, does the underlying investment in the fund have to be long-term to meet the step-up and permanent exclusion requirements? So I'll, uh, I'll answer the second part first. Um, by definition, it should be zero to 10 years. Again, the longer you keep the investment in an opportunity zone, the more, uh, that you get to chop away at those gains. As well as, again, as I mentioned peripherally before, that you are gain, you're getting gains on top of the gains. So um, the longer you deploy those funds within a 10-year window, the more the chance you have of wiping all of the gains out over that time period. Um, the other part of the question is about deployment, and it kind of peripherally discuss, talks about timing. So again, right now it's a moving target. The law was passed in December of 2017. We have until uh, 2026. So I would think that um, you would want to deploy as soon as possible, but you, no one can deploy until the, the actual rules are in place because those, that's going to define the who, what, where um, on the ground side. So I think that it's kind of like a race, you know, everybody's at the starting gate and the horses are all chomping at the bit. Uh, as soon as that the rules come in, I think the flag will be up and um, funds will deploy fairly quickly from there. With our webinar series, we've kind of take it, taken it upon ourselves to do a series approach in which we're, we're laying the groundwork in each series or each webinar we're sharing information that we're hoping you're taking back to your community or your business. And your, you know, your next step is you're looking for uh, individuals with capital gains. You're starting your fund. You're identifying projects. So we're, we're taking it as a story approach uh, in the hopes that the local government or the projects within those qualified opportunity zones are doing the same. All right. Um, next question, what can the fund pay for? Is it just hard costs like land, or can the fund cover costs due to remediation? An example, the Albuquerque rail yard. So there, back to the early part of the uh, conversation, um, there are no rules about the expenditure other than the SIN businesses. So again, this is that's an important point to note on a social impact side, you're talking about remediating a, a brownfield in a, uh, an area that, that has been blighted in Albuquerque, and everybody believes that once that gets done, it's going to really just synergize uh, that part of Albuquerque. So there are no rules against that, which is what makes it very attractive for foundations to consider partnerships um, to take on some of the mitigation of some of those risks. But absolutely, 100%. Uh, there are no rules in terms of the actual uh, uses of the funds as long as obviously 90% of the fund gets deployed in an opportunity zone. Great. 
Great. Um, next question. I'm trying to get through these quickly. Uh, can all individuals with capital gains start their own OZ fund, or does the fund need to be managed by a financial institution? So it's kind of already stressed. So any individual, uh, I could start my own fund. I could pool my money with other individuals, and we could do a larger fund. Don't do it. No. <laughs> it, I, I would encourage anybody who's considering, uh, uh, who has capital gains, who's considering uh, starting in a fund, is really to find somebody else that's starting a fund and then look at investing uh, with them. And I, like I mentioned before, Invest US in uh, Albuquerque is looking to set up a fund. There are other uh, foundations that are looking. To, I think that there's a very high uh, cost associated with setting something like that up on a legal and, and financial basis. And unless you have, I would say a million dollars, if a gain of a million dollars is a reasonable number to, to, to say, well, you can do it on your own. But other than that, I would say try to partner up with a, a fund that's out there. Well, and not to mention the technical aspect that goes into it, whether it's the accounting, being able to show where the gain, that they are gains, where they came from, where they've been deployed. So to Juan's point, um, that is that is a high necessity. The critical factor here is that you're going to be dealing with the IRS directly. And I've we've had a lot of experience with new markets tax credit projects. You know, one, one bad move or one uh, move outside of the rules and the entire project uh, is declared uh, null and void and everybody pays taxes. That's a seven year locked up project with a lot of very smart lawyers and financial people and even that happens. So I would encourage people to find a fund to invest in and uh, potentially uh, fund managers could determine to set up funds to get a, a pool a lot of smaller uh, uh, capital gains investors. Okay, the next question, and, and I hope I get this right. Um, could several opportunity zones partner for a project in common, say to develop a transshipment partnership between Santa Teresa point of entry um, for additional storage? But then um, the question goes on to say, perhaps a better example would be two opportunity zone projects collaborating to make improvements to a local highway. Example would be the trail of the ancient agents to improve opportunities for tourism. So, I, if I understand the question, is I would turn it around and think about the projects again. This is a way to, if you have two or three adjacent or fairly near opportunity zones in your community, and you want to pitch a project that involves different zones and deployment in different zones then that's a marketing opportunity that you have uh, to the fund. Um, I would look at it that way. And again, we're more than happy to sit down with individual projects and try to help communities and projects positioning, trying to figure out how they would best position themselves. We're happy to make ourselves available to have those conversations. Um, you know, but and that's a good question. But I think, um, yeah, I would focus on, you know, connecting the projects together and then pitching it to a fund. And during the early on portion, um, be before the nomination took place, when it was states discussing with other states, this, this same idea came up of, well, are we competing? Is our zone on the border of Texas competing with the zone on the border of New Mexico? And it was addressed in the same way that Juan just spoke to it, of where you're looking at it by a project by project basis. And if there is overlap, that's just a marketing tool that you're able to use and, and utilize for success. Next question, how will new market tax credits and opportunity zones work together on the same project? Well, I mean, I can envision it. Uh, I can give you my, my vision of it, and I started to allude to it earlier. I think that in a typical new market tax credit structure, you have, if anybody's seen the boxes that John Brooks puts together and are very complicated, uh, uh, you have a box. You know, on one side of the page, that is the uh, new market tax credit investor, and you have another box on the other side of the page, that's the leveraged lender. And a leveraged lender could be a, a bank, it could be a grant, it could be a number of entities. So utilizing that model, you can have a number of boxes whereby the new market tax credit investor provides the new market 
uh, percentage of the project, and then you have potentially, let's go crazy, let's get a leveraged lender that's a foundation that wants to put up some of its own capital to facilitate this project, but at the end of the project, they're going to get their capital back or a good portion of the capital back. And then you have the, the uh, Opportunity Zone Fund itself. So there's a three box structure that kind of lets the funds flow into the project. It'll lock it up for seven years for the new market component, but it ideally should go on for the full length of the Opportunity Zone period. So conceivably, the new market's unwind would happen into year seven while the project maintains its status as an entity throughout the next three years. That would yield the maximum benefit, and I think that, that um, we'll sit down with John Brooks and New Mexico Finance Authority and come up with a few scenarios and kind of box those out to see how they might look just for just for fun. And uh, what you just heard was, was a pseudo Rain Man creativity on how to financially structure specific projects. And, and that was pretty brilliant, and, and it, it may take you time to understand what you just heard, but being able to utilize different funding mechanisms to make sure your specific project happens, that's something that the finance team does very well. And is, I'm putting words in their mouth, but they're more than capable and willing to, to help look at those and structure those projects with you. Great, thanks. Um, next question is, if the primary headquarters is based in an opportunity zone, can the business take advantage of the full OZ incentives for business activities taking outside of the OZ? OZ. Uh, an example would be an incubator based in an OZ with startups with OZ primary headquarters, but with wide distribution centers and employment outside. Mm. I think it's the kind of question that if I was in the IRS, I'd say, we're going to have to look at that very carefully. Um, I, I, I think the, West, the best way to think of this is that the 90% the of the funds need to be deployed in that zone. So you're talking infrastructure, you're talking building acquisition or land acquisition. Um, you know, the, the satellite activity outside of that zone, while it might be interesting and ancillary, now that's again where you've got potential foundation considerations, right? Because let's say that you set up in this opportunity zone, you deploy the majority of your uh, capital expenses in that zone, but then you have this mentioned as ancillary kind of a satellite activity. Well, that wouldn't be possible unless you had the initial zone uh, uh, infrastructure in place. But if you can do that and then partner with a foundation to take the piece that's the satellite and some assistance there. I mean, again, I'm just spitballing here. I think at the end of the day, the IRS is a very, it's a very Catholic organization in the sense that they don't have a variation of rules. And so when you're talking about opportunity zones, I think you want to be conservative. You don't want to be that creative in terms of outside of the zone. You really want to be creative inside the zone. And I think deploying uh, the majority of the funds, again, 90% have to be deployed in the opportunity zone. If you only need 10% to do the satellite work, maybe that could work. I don't know. Okay. Uh, next question is, the NMEDD research going to include overlap with designated metropolitan redevelopment areas? I think we're going to look at all options and possibilities, definitely layer in uh, MRAs, TIDs, whatever is in place in a community, if it's on a GIS layered map, we have the potential to add it as a layer. That being said, um, this is not NMEDD's sole focus. Uh, we are a small department uh, with multiple projects and ongoing uh, activities. So I I don't want to be the one who overpromises and underdelivers, uh, but that is something that we will definitely look at and consider. To steal uh, Las Luna's tagline, small agency with big ideas. <laughs> so I think... Uh, um, hey, we do have a, just two more questions. Um, is there any plan for New Mexico to institute capital gains 
reductions for opportunity zone, opportunity funds on state taxes? Well, there's a new session starting in January. I believe it's a 60-day session, and we will have a brand new administration. I think if one ever had the opportunity, no pun intended, to uh, to enhance particular uh, incentive, um, that would be one that sounds pretty good to me, um, especially, uh, again, we have the Angel Investment Tax Credit Program, and if you can kind of, you know, connect those together, I think that is a very reasonable uh, approach, and again, as citizen legislators, you're all uh, uh, able to go out there and lobby for these things, so it sounds reasonable to me. Great. Uh, have you received any information as to what will happen with depreciation recapture from real estate sales? So the real estate piece is really tricky. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I think is, is the reasons the rules are not being finalized is that we've heard a few different, or we've seen a few different scenarios presented whereby um, it, it provides a kind of pass-through holding company scenario where I, not unlike the question about deploying in the capital outside of the zone, uh, when when you're talking about real estate and, and, and other things that, that have financing that's very fungible, um, it, it creates some, some issues. So I think one of the questions that came up was about real estate holding companies and then how they can kind of pass through expenses and, you know, end up uh, being vehicles uh, whereby the no taxes get paid. Um, I think that's part of the reasons why the rules are not in place yet. They're trying to figure out all those scenarios. So I don't have a direct answer to that. Um, I think that's a very creative, uh, I'm imagining it maybe it's an accountant that provided that question. But a uh, very creative question. And as soon as we get answers, if you wanna, we're gonna have these questions and as we get answers, if we get answers, we'll, we will post them on our website under the FAQs. And actually, uh, Deborah Burns chimed in and said that her fund will engage a tax advisor to model real estate investments to optimize depreciation and other elements to meet the investor's needs. Sounds right. We would really appreciate that and, uh, you know, make sure that um, all prospectus uh, say, you know, that uh, past performance does not indicate future growth. <laughs> All right, final question. Um, if the sunset date is 2026, what happens to the investment if the purchase is uh, made in 2025? Um, well, I could imagine that you're not going to get much of a gain in one year or realize much of a gain within the one year. Um, so I don't think that scenario is a likely or possible scenario, at least in terms of investing. Um, again, in order to get the full value of this incentive, you have to deploy it for the full period of time, uh, which is 10 years. Um, and if you only deploy something for one year, I guess, I don't know, I guess if you're Bill Gates and you had a billion dollar uh, gain, <laughs> one year might be enough, I don't know. But in seriousness, um, you you really couldn't, capture enough of a value in one year to make any of this worthwhile the work the paperwork the legal stuff so um really i think the honest truth is look at five-year horizons look at seven-year horizons look at 10-year horizons those that's where the big uh value uh aspect is and i think we're kind of done and i'm very very surprised and thrilled at the number of questions and the amount of time that we've We've taken it here, so I'm just going to turn it over to Joanna. Thank you for inviting us to your web webinar series. Thank you. Uh, I just want to um, mention some upcoming uh, NMEDD finance development team events. Um, Fund it is coming up. Actually, the application deadline is this Friday, so you still have time to get applications in. Um, the meeting will be on September 4th, and that will be at the North Central Economic Development, um, their, their division, their, the North Central COG in Santa Fe. Um, when we send this uh, presentation out, these will be live links, so you can just click that link and go directly to the application. The, the next webinar that we will have is, is tentative at this point. 
um, but that will be September 25th, and you can go to the finance team webpage and see the upcoming webinars and get registered there. Um, the Rural Efficient Business Program Workshop, our next one will be in Carlsbad, and um, you can go to the website to register. And then just want to point out, too, that our new um, credit enhancement program is actively enrolling projects and lenders. So um, we'd like to encourage you to, to reach out um, if, if you have lenders in your community that are interested in the program or projects that are lacking in collateral, um, please get with us and, and participate. And I just wanted to briefly mention that the Community Development Finance Association is uh, hosting a conference, um, I believe it's in Washington, D.C., um, sometime the first week of September. For anybody that's interested, we'll post the link on our website. Um, uh, I would encourage people to uh, to go, and um, I'd love to go, but just not possible. But again, the, uh, the Community Development Finance Association, CDFA, is sponsoring a Opportunity Zone uh, uh, live conference where you can interact with other states and talk to them about what they're doing and uh, learn uh, on a national level what, what others are, are, are all about. And um, here's some follow-up contacts. You'll have Brian's contact, Juan's contact, um, our webpage, and the department's webpage. And I'll update this to include the CDFA um, link, too. So as mentioned, we'll send this out hopefully today or tomorrow. But thanks very much. Thanks, Juan, and thanks, Ryan, for, for all the hard work. They've been putting a lot of hours into all the research and, and time into exploring this better. So um, reach out to us with questions, and um, we're here to help. Go to our YouTube page when you've missed some of these webinars. If you can't sleep, go to the YouTube page. It's fun. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you.